The anime begins with a boy named Iki, who was labeled as the worst one in the academy because he wasn't gifted with any magical talent and was considered as a lonely loser nerd, not worthy of having his family name and was cast away from the village because he can't even do the most simple magic spell and can't even become a godlike magician like the rest of his family. Due to his lack of talent, his own family had disowned him and left him on his own to struggle by himself. However, he was motivated to demonstrate his value despite lacking natural talents like his family, and he resolved to emerge victorious in the esteemed seven-star tournament. One day, he comes across some big news about Princess Stella, who was the strongest and most beautiful pink-haired magical knight. After learning more about her seemingly perfect life, he started to feel jealous and thought about how unfair things are. So he went for a run, thinking that the tough weather might help him deal with his envy. While honing his sword skills, he aspired to transform into a magical knight, an extraordinary individual capable of materializing their soul as armor and wielding superhuman abilities. After his training, he goes back to his room and finds a hot girl there who forgot to lock the door. The girl, who turns out to be Princess Stella newly enrolled in the school, gets embarrassed and complains to the school director. Surprisingly, the director talks about the school's history and principles, warning about the harm his actions could bring to the school's reputation. She insists he takes responsibility like a man. He gives a weak apology, but Stella remains firm, suggesting a serious duel to make up for his mistake. He tries to reason with her, but it only makes her angrier. In a last-ditch effort to avoid trouble, he compliments her beauty, and to his surprise, it works. Since she was unmarried and single for a long time, Stella blushed hard. However, the director interrupted their romance and revealed that they are roommates. She had put together the weakest, Icky, and the strongest, Stella, together in one room, thinking it was a good match. However, this leads to an argument, and the director proposes a mock battle to settle the dispute. Stella suggests the loser becomes the winner's servant, and Icky the simp happily agrees. At the battlefield, the director reminds them that this is a mock battle ensuring no physical harm, but one can drain the opponent's physical strength to win. A fierce battle unfolds, and Icky showcases impressive sword skills, skillfully countering Stella's fire sword attacks. He compliments her talent and hard work and reveals his technique, Blade Steel, which allows him to see through his opponent's moves. Just when Icky was about to land a decisive blow, Stella used her talent of magic and Icky's attack had no effect. She gathered all of her magic and used a formidable move on Icky. However, to everyone's surprise, Icky used the magic he had invented by himself and dodged all of her attacks at supersonic speed. Ultimately, he defeated her with a powerful attack, earning him the victory. After the battle, Stella ends up in a hospital where she questions the director about how Icky could defeat her despite his low rank. The director explains that the ranking is based on a knight's overall ability rather than their actual fighting prowess. She reluctantly reveals that there is currently no system in place to evaluate Icky fairly. Stella then reveals her reason for studying abroad, to be recognized for her own abilities rather than simply being gifted. Later, Stella enters Icky's room to apologize, but finds him sleeping soundly. As she admires him for a while, he unintentionally wakes up. Much to her embarrassment, she apologizes to him and agrees to be his servant or dog, as per the earlier agreement to fulfill his desires. However, he simply laughs it off and asks her to be his roommate, to which she happily accepts. The next day, as they finish their morning run together, he casually mentions that running 20 kilometers daily is part of his routine making it sound as ordinary as brushing his teeth. She responds by saying she was able to keep up with him today, suggesting she can match his pace. He then reveals that his sister is starting school that day, raising her suspicions. He reassures her that they are indeed full-blooded siblings. In the classroom, their new teacher, Yuri Ariki, warmly welcomes all the newcomers and explains the rules for the upcoming competition. She informs them that the selection will now be based on actual fighting and the top six individuals will be chosen as school representatives. But just as she's about to elaborate on the fighting techniques, something bizarre happens. She spills red liquid all over the floor, creating a scene worthy of a tomato juice commercial. Later, Icky and Stella visit her in the hospital, and she explains that this happens almost daily. She vomits about a liter of red liquid each day. He advises her to take it easy and not push herself too hard and reveals to Stella that it's because of his sensei. Yuri, that he was able to get accepted into this school. Later, a girl named Kagami suddenly approaches him, praising his performance in the mock battle, and excitedly asks for an interview. Iki blushes, and Stella walks away, visibly upset with jealousy. Politely, he declines the interview offer and hurries to catch up with Stella. 
However, it's interrupted again by a girl named Shizuku who approaches him, calling him her brother. Iki agrees that she's his sister, but she surprises everyone by kissing him on the lips, leaving the onlookers gasping. Man, this show is like the Game of Thrones of anime. Shizuku is shocked and upset, expressing how much she missed Iki during their four-year separation. Stella steps in, pulling Shizuku away and scolding Iki for engaging in what she considers an inappropriate activity with his sister. Shizuku argues with Stella about Iki, and in the heat of the moment, Stella accidentally reveals to everyone that she and Iki have a master-servant relationship, surprising everyone. Shizuku summons her water sword, and Stella does the same, escalating tension as they exchange insults about each other's looks before attacking. The director intervenes, taking them to the ladies' restroom and sternly warning them that using weapons outside designated areas is strictly forbidden. As punishment, she orders them to clean all the ladies' restrooms for a week. After the director leaves, instead of a sword match, they continue their verbal battle, trading insults about their appearance once again. After serving their detention, Shizuku warns Stella not to behave shamelessly, and reveals how Iki felt ignored and treated as if he didn't exist. Stella is shocked by this revelation. Later, Stella confronts Iki, who opens up about his tough childhood. He shares how his family mistreated him for not having the same powers as his powerful grandfather, Ryoma, a well-known samurai. His family excluded him from events and made him feel invisible. Iki recalls a New Year's party when he decided to run away from home due to neglect. Lost and with nowhere to go, he was on the verge of giving up when his grandfather Rayoma appeared and encouraged him to persevere. Rayoma's words inspire Iki to become a strong knight like his grandfather. Iki reveals that he had to learn everything on his own, and nobody taught him. Until now, people struggled to accept him becoming a knight, with the old director setting rules to make him fail. However, the new director is more supportive and has assigned him to work with Stella. The next day, Iki and Stella practice with their swords for the upcoming competition to become school representatives at the Seven Star Festival. After practice, Stella tells Iki about her opponent Mamatani, a third grade student. Iki starts sharing details about Mamatani's fighting style, but Stella prefers surprises in battles for better training. They agree on not always knowing their opponent's abilities. Later, Stella nervously asks Iki on a date for the next day, but he gets a text from his sister, changing their plans. The next day, Stella tags along with Iki and Shizuku, feeling jealous. They go shopping, and Stella gets upset seeing Iki and Shizuku holding hands. A heated argument ensues, and Shizuku introduces her roommate, Alice. They explore the mall, and Stella accuses Shizuku of inappropriate behavior. Later, at a restaurant, jealousy flares up as Shizuku accidentally spills ice cream on Stella's cheek. Iki wipes it off, causing more tension. Shizuku criticizes Stella, while Alice supports and encourages her. In the men's restroom, Iki talks to Alice about his reserved sister, Shizuku. They hear a noise outside and hide in Alice's shadow dimension. They discover potential kidnappers in the mall and decide to investigate. The school director grants them permission to handle the situation. Meanwhile, the kidnappers take hostages, including Stella and Shizuku. Stella intervenes when a child is threatened, using her fire attack. Bishop, the boss, appears, absorbs Stella's attack, and punishes her. To save the hostages, she follows Bishop's demand to remove her clothes. Iki, unaware of this, struggles to free himself. Shizuku creates a magical barrier, protecting the hostages. Iki, Alice, and Stella defeat the kidnappers. Iki apologizes to Stella, and Shizuku admires her courage. At that moment, Kirihara appears, saving the day with a laser attack. Later, he brags about his heroics and insults Iki, but Stella defends Iki. However, Kirihara exposed Iki's past defeat against him and revealed that he was his first opponent in the upcoming tournament. The next day, the competition begins, and Stella's first opponent is Mamatani, also known as the Heavy Tank due to his formidable defense. He possesses a very rare armored device known as Goliath, which releases a tremendous amount of power in close combat situations. The audience applauds Mamatani for his combat skills and seniority in the competition, believing he will be a tough adversary but she faces him with unwavering confidence and intimidates him to give in. As a result, she is declared the winner, shocking everyone and proving her prowess as a formidable contender in the competition. Later, Iki watches a video of Kirihara's fighting skills along with Stella and is shocked by his abilities. He asks if Kirihara was using an area invisible technique, a method that makes one's presence and smell undetectable, essentially creating a perfect camouflage. 
Ikki confirms that it's a feature of Kirahara's weapon, which gives him a tricky advantage. Stella expresses her dislike for Kirahara's fighting style, which involves attacking enemies from a safe distance using stealth camouflage. Ikki agrees, saying that if Stella were to face Kirahara in battle, he would likely withdraw, as her wide-range attacks would easily counter his stealth and area-invisible tactics. He then reveals that Kirahara usually avoids fighting opponents who utilize wide-range combat attacks like Stella and that Kirahara has earned the nickname The Hunter because of his sneaky tactics. She disapproves of Kirahara's cowardly approach, referring to him as a chicken but also acknowledges that he can prove to be a formidable opponent against Iki. She expresses concern for his safety and asks if he will be okay facing him. Iki reassures her, stating that he has found a way to defeat Kirahara and is confident he will emerge victorious. Later, while on a determined run, Iki encounters Alice, who inquires if there was any history of grudge between him and Kirahara. Iki sighs and opens up to Alice about his past, telling him that last year his family, who had connections with the previous school director, sought a way to expel him from the school. Kirahara saw this as an opportunity to target him and began bullying him. He challenged him to a duel to prove his worth, but he was not interested in participating. Despite Iki's reluctance, Kirahara persistently pestered and attacked him repeatedly, even when Iki was unarmed and unwilling to engage in a fight. As a result, he wasn't punished or expelled by the school director. After hearing this, Alice expresses sympathy and wishes him luck before leaving. As the battle approaches, Stella asks Iki if he wants to watch ongoing battles, but he replies that he will be in the waiting area, focusing on his strategies. In the waiting area, he receives instructions from a digital screen warning him that the competition battle is not a simulation and can cause serious harm. The screen asks him to proceed only if he fully understands the consequences, and he confidently pushes the button to approve his participation. Suddenly, a girl dressed in a red kimono mocks Iki for making hasty decisions, but he responds that he is confident in his abilities and has no hesitation. He recognizes her as Sekayo, a demon princess from the top league, and she is thrilled that he knows about her. Out of nowhere, she hugs him and offers to give him special private lessons that night. However, their conversation is rudely interrupted by the director who questions Sekayo about her misconduct against Iki, and reminds her about the match she was supposed to supervise. Sekayo, who is supposed to be a new instructor, tries to hide behind Iki, but the director drags her away from him as the match commences. Iki thinks back to his childhood and the first time he met Stella. The announcer enthusiastically welcomes everyone to the match, and much to Sekayo's annoyance, she is tasked with the duty of being the commentator. Kirahara enters the arena with confidence, receiving cheers from the crowd. Iki even steps into the arena, and the battle begins. Kirahara uses his area invisible technique to attack Iki from different directions, all the while mocking and taunting him. Despite the challenge, Iki manages to deflect most of Kirahara's laser attacks, skillfully tracing their origin to locate him. However, Kirahara suddenly disappears and announces that he will inform Iki about where he will strike before actually attacking him. With this new strategy, Kirahara manages to land several blows on Iki's body, and as a result, Iki suffers serious injuries from the unexpected assault. He explains that he can now use his invisibility on his laser attack, thus Iki won't be able to deflect them like previously. Seeing Iki in bad shape, Stella becomes angry and wonders why he didn't attack first. However, Alice explains that Iki was likely nervous, which makes Stella realize the truth and feel guilty for not recognizing it earlier. Back at the arena, Kirahara continues his relentless attacks on Iki and decides to reveal to everyone the condition he made with the new director for his graduation. The condition is that Iki must win the Seven Star Festival battle, otherwise, he won't be allowed to graduate. When the audience hears of this revelation, they start laughing, as the Seven Star battle is extremely tough to win. They mock Iki, saying that there is no way an F-rank like him can win it. Kirahara delivers a fatal blow, and Iki collapses to the ground, while Kirahara mockingly calls him the worst one. The crowd joins in laughing and chanting worst one as well. In rage, Stella's fiery aura flares up, and she demands everyone to shut up and stop making fun of her favorite knight. She then encourages Iki not to give up, and upon hearing her words, he finds the determination to get back on his feet and thanks her before preparing to counter-attack Kirahara. He realizes that he needs to rely on his imperfect technique, in two Shura, to counter Kirahara's attacks. Utilizing his perfect vision, he sees through Kirahara's moves and successfully defeats him, emerging as the winner. However, the strain of the intense battle takes its toll, and Iki collapses on the ground. 
Sekayo explains to everyone that Ikki used his sword stealing technique, which enables him to understand his opponent's logic and use it against them, just like he did with Stella during her mock battle. Later, in the hospital, Stella stays by Ikki's side, feeling deeply concerned for him. Exhausted from the events, she eventually falls asleep next to him, sharing a heartwarming moment together. Meanwhile, Alice consoles Shizuku, who is emotionally affected by the intense battle and its aftermath. When Stella wakes up, she scolds Ikki for watching her sleep without waking her up. However, he seizes the moment to confess his feelings for her, expressing how glad he is to have met her. Blushing, Stella reciprocates her feelings and kisses him on the cheek. In the tender moment, they promise to stay together and strive to reach the highest knighthood and look forward to facing each other in the final battle. It's been two weeks since Stella and Ikki confessed their feelings for each other, but Ikki hasn't taken any action on it yet, causing Stella to worry. She finds herself practicing with her sword, preparing for the upcoming battles, but her concerns about their relationship linger. Meanwhile, at the selection match, Ikki performs exceptionally well, winning five consecutive matches and thus re-establishing himself as a formidable opponent, shedding the reputation of being the worst one. The audience praises him, referring to him as the uncrowned sword king. Later, after one of his matches, the reporter girl Kagami and her friend approach him and express their wish to learn swordsmanship from him. Without hesitation, he agrees to teach them. This makes Stella worried and jealous, as she fears that more people seeking Ikki's attention might create competition for his affection, and potentially cause problems for their relationship. Seeing him getting the affections of so many girls, the boys in his class also start to envy him and decide to bully him. When the class begins, instructor Yuri-chan enters, but before she can start teaching, she vomits red liquid in the class again, causing panic among the students and leading to the dismissal of the class. Back in their room, Stella expresses her frustration to Iki, saying that he is too generous and should prioritize spending more time with her instead of teaching others. However, Iki, being somewhat oblivious, doesn't fully understand her real concerns and casually responds that he doesn't mind helping others. Just as Stella is about to express her desire for a more involved relationship. She sees that Ikki has fallen asleep, which further fuels her anger and frustration. The following day, Ikki teaches the girls about balancing on one leg, a Chinese martial art technique to improve core strength. He explains that during a fight, more weight is put on one leg than both, making this technique essential. The reporter girl Kagami diligently takes notes of the lesson, eager to publish an article about it in the future. Seeing him surrounded by girls, the boys in the class grow increasingly angry and confront him. They call him a failed senpai and summon their weapons to challenge him. However, to their surprise, Ikki easily handles them without using his spiritual sword, effortlessly deflecting their attacks with his bare hands. Realizing his strength, the boys accept their defeat and bow down to him, expressing their envy and desire to be strong and popular like him. In a change of heart, the boys request Ikki to teach them as well, wanting to learn from him. He happily agrees to become their mentor, and they address him as their master. Meanwhile, Kagami continues taking notes, capturing every moment of this unexpected turn of events. Later, Shizuku comes up to him with drinks and asks him to teach her swordsmanship as well. However, he suggests that she can learn from a family master instead. Shizuku then questions why Stella is holding two bottles of juice as well. Embarrassed, Stella explains that it's because she was too thirsty and proceeds to finish off both bottles of juice, surprising him. In truth, she wanted to be the one to provide him with refreshment, but Shizuku beat her to it. So Stella pretends that the drinks are for herself to avoid appearing like a loser in front of him. After her drinking marathon, Stella insists that she wants him to teach her as well. However, when she sees him hesitating, she withdraws the idea and runs away in annoyance and upset. On her way, she comes across Alice, who questions her about Shizuku's whereabouts. She tells him and notices a game in Alice's hand. He explains that it is an autumn game called Private School Prince Academy, and hands it over to her to play. Later, in her room, she plays the autumn game, imagining the characters as Ikki and wishes that he could also be more affectionate like the autumn guys. Just then, Ikki walks into the room and surprises her. He asks her if she wants to join him and the others where he will be giving them swordsmanship lessons. Still upset with him about earlier, she asks why she should join him. 
In response, he tells her that she has already surpassed the levels he could teach, praising her swordplay techniques, which are entirely different from his own. She agrees to join him at the pool to watch him train others. Later, on their way back to their room in the bus, they hold each other's hand, finding comfort in each other's presence. However, their moment of peace is interrupted when they both simultaneously receive an email from the school informing them about their respective opponents in the upcoming matches. Iki will be facing the clerk of the student council, and Stella will be facing Ikazuchi, the secretary of the student council. The next day, Iki faces tomorrow in the battle, who uses an attack called Runner's High that lets her keep running at an insane speed until she decides to stop. Iki struggles to keep up with her, but he manages to outmaneuver and capture her, securing his victory in the match. Meanwhile, Stella fights against Ikazuchi, who uses his ability called Accumulation of Slashing Weight, and attacks her. However, she manages to defeat him, securing her victory in the match, just like Iki. Later, Shizuku joins Iki to congratulate him on his victory, offering to sleep next to him and nurse him back to normal. Stella gets disgusted by this and asks him to keep his distance from Shizuku. However, Shizuku turns on her charm, and Iki falls for it, seemingly unaware of Shizuku's intentions. She turns to Stella, relishing in her victory and emphasizing the bond between siblings, asking Stella not to come between them. Suddenly, Alice reveals that they have been followed by someone for nearly a week. Iki calls out the stalker to emerge from hiding. A shy girl named Ayase Atsuji comes out from behind a tree, using branches as her cover. Stellar recalls that Ayase is the same girl she accidentally hit with a ball during pool training. The girl starts panicking and quickly leaves the scene, but in her hurry, she accidentally falls into a nearby water body. They rescue her from the water and take her to the hospital. Ayaz apologizes for her behavior and reveals that she is a third-year student. Iki recognizes her last name and asks if she is the daughter of Kaido Ayatsuji, a renowned sword master. She confirms that she is indeed his daughter, which excites Iki. Shizuku tells Stella that Kaido is known as the last samurai, who earned victories in many prestigious battles and tournaments despite not possessing any magical knightly abilities like them. Iki shares his admiration for his father, telling her that he was his role model when he was a kid. Ayaz then reveals that her dad is no longer actively participating in matches due to an injury from his earlier battles that led him to be hospitalized. Shizuku then questions Iki, asking why she was stalking them. Ayaz confesses that she needs training and has been practicing alone for a long time. She wanted Iki's help in teaching her, but she was too shy to actually ask him. Iki kindly offers to train her in swordplay, and she immediately agrees. Later, Iki and Ayaz practice their swordplay and he observes that she has a good foundation, probably due to her father. He stops their training and advises her that, in order to improve, she should not simply imitate her father's moves exactly. Instead, he encourages her to find her own style and develop unique techniques. He then goes over to her to correct her posture, and she starts blushing while Stella and Shizuku get jealous by their interaction. He talks about how males and females have different anatomy, and how she can use it to her advantage rather than imitating her dad's technique. After this special instruction, Ayaz starts to make progress in her training and becomes impressed with Iki's teaching. Later, he apologizes to her for being hands-on in their training, and she tells him it's not a big deal. As Stella and Shizuku, who observed their bond, come to understand that Iki was simply teaching Ayaz swordplay, their jealousy subsides. Ayaz tells him that she is now confident in improving her abilities and becomes determined to win the Seven Star Battle Festival. Later, in their room, Stella asks Iki if he enjoys giving special instructions to Ayaz and playfully requests the same treatment. But he tells her that it's not like that and assures her not to be insecure, as he only has feelings for her. The next day, Ayaz and Stella train against each other and Iki happily watches them. After the training session, Ayaz treats them to dinner as a gesture of gratitude. At the restaurant, Stella eats like a pig as she doesn't have to pay the bill. Ayaz asks her how she maintains her figure despite eating so ferociously. Iki laughs awkwardly at this and changes the topic. Ayaz then expresses her gratitude to Iki for teaching her, and he modestly says it's not a big deal. The rest of the dinner would have proceeded without any action, but trouble arises when a gang of men, led by a big guy called Corrado, approaches their table and harasses Ayaz. Iki intervenes and tells him to stay away. They try to provoke him into a fight, and Corrado smashes a bottle on Iki's head and challenges him. As the situation escalates, the other customers fear for their safety and flee from the scene. A waiter attempts to call the police but is halted by a mysterious girl dressed in all white, carrying a matching umbrella. Witnessing Iki getting beaten up, Stella is ready to step in and defend him, but he stops her. 
They continue to provoke him, but he smiles like a psychopath and remains calm, taking in their attack. Tired of not receiving any reaction out of him, the gangsters eventually give up their attempts to provoke him and leave. After the gangsters leave, Stella scolds Icky for letting them get away and stopping her from intervening as well. He calmly explains that he refrained from retaliating to avoid getting expelled from the academy. But Stella tells him that he didn't have to use his sword, so he would not have got expelled, and that he couldn't have taken on the gangsters barehanded as they appeared quite strong. Suddenly, a small boy appears out of nowhere and informs them that Corrado is known as the Sword Eater, and is the ace of an academy called Donro. The boy applauds Icky's judgment and reveals that Corrado was in the top 8 of the previous year's 7-star battle festival, shocking everyone. The mysterious Umbrella Girl also appears and agrees with the boy's statement. Stella questions Icky if he knows any of them, and he tells her that the little boy is called Utica, who is the vice president of the student council of another academy, and that the mysterious lady is Canada, who is in charge of a county in the same school. Stella gets suspicious when the little boy Utica offers to heal Icky's wounds, who accepts his offer. Later, on their way from the restaurant, Ayaz questions Icky if he's alright, and he tells her that he is perfectly fine all thanks to the little boy's treatment. Suddenly, he receives a mail from the school informing that his upcoming selection battle is with Ayas. This creates an awkward tension between them, and she runs away embarrassed. During her training, Ayas becomes very distant and stops coming to their training sessions altogether. Iki discusses the matter with Alice, who advises him to chill and says that Ayas will make a move before their battle the next day. As predicted, Icky receives a message from Ayaz asking him to meet her alone at the rooftop building at 3 a.m. Alice warns him that it might be a trap, but Icky decides to go, stating that he can't refuse a request from his friend. Alice warns him again that he should be prepared to end his friendship with her if anything goes wrong. Despite Alice's worry, Icky sticks to his decision not to let anything break their friendship and goes to meet Ayaz on the rooftop, as she requested. Ayaz asks about the promise he made with Stella to win the tournament, and Iki assures her they'll give their best effort. She presses further, questioning what he'll do if he faces an unbeatable enemy. He insists on fighting fairly, even if he doesn't win. Ayaz disagrees, arguing that justice without results is nonsense. She summons her sword and falls back from the roof, prompting Iki to use his ultimate Aitashura attack to save her. Afterward, she admits tricking him into using the attack, which can only be used once a day. Now, with a selection match in 10 hours, he won't have time to fully recover and use the attack again. Ayaz explains she now has a chance to win. Feeling betrayed, Iki questions why she's going to such lengths. She states winning is all that matters, despite the potential disgrace to her family. Iki warns her, but she remains determined to win. He returns to his room and collapses on a sleeping Stella, waking her. Concerned, she rushes him to the hospital. In the hospital, he sees Shizuko and Alice, along with Stella, all concerned for him. He worries he missed the match, but Stella assures him there's still time. The director enters, taking Iki for an investigation. Iki refuses to discuss the incident, willing to take responsibility for damages. The director reveals Ayaz's father was left unable to wield a sword after a battle with Corrado, who took their land. Ayaz aims to regain her family's honor through the battle festival. Reflecting on Ayaz's determination, Iki, Alice, and Stella seek ways to defeat her. The battle begins, and Iki faces Ayaz. He swiftly attacks, but Ayaz uses a mysterious ability that confuses the audience, including Stella. No one knew about Ayaz's abilities because she hadn't joined any battles until this year. The battles she won were based on her sword skills without using magic. Iki faces a tough situation but still attacks. Ayaz uses her taste of wind scratch attack creating invisible whirlwinds and traps with her device. The opening wound is her device's unique ability, hiding invisible sword cuts. However, this breaks the rules, and Ayaz is lucky no one noticed. Iki skillfully dodges her attack and avoids her tricks. Ayaz is surprised and wonders if he figured out her tactics. She attacks fiercely, and he collapses, realizing one more hit could worsen his wound. To counter, he uses irregular guarding and recalls requesting Yuri as the supervisor if he violated any rules during the battle. Unaware, Ayaz continues attacking. Iki tells her she's losing herself, ignoring lessons and her true abilities, trying to be something she's not. He encourages her to fight fairly with pride. She shouts about her father's fate, determined to help her regain pride. Iki faces her head on, countering all attacks with perfect vision. Ayaz realizes she needs to be faster than his vision but recalls her family's misfortunes. She attacks with determination, but Iki uses a powerful strike with his fourth secret sword and defeats her. 
Ikki praises Ayas for not giving up on her father's legacy, offering help to regain what she lost. He tells her that pride in their sword is crucial when one is pushed to the edge. Touched, Ayas admits deceiving herself and feels miserable. Ikki assures her that the strength in her heart remains because she didn't abandon her father's memory. Grateful for Ikki's kindness, Ayas seeks his help without a reason. He wants to help her as a friend, and Ayas sees him as a cool and true swordsman like her father. She pleads for help, and Ikki appreciates her determination. For the battle, Ayas fondly reminisces about her days spent with her father. Due to his heart problem, he had to retire when she was still in junior school. However, he never gave up on guiding her and his other students with unwavering dignity. He taught her crucial techniques like relaxing her shoulders while keeping her arms strong, tightening her wrists without straining and mastering the secret technique Tenai Muho. Ayas found these teachings challenging, but her father praised her for faithfully following his instructions. He constantly reminded her to take pride in her abilities, always uphold civility, help the weak, and stand against evil. Those lessons resonated deeply with Ayas, and she carried them in her heart even after her father's unfortunate illness. Later that day, Stella reads on her phone about Corrado who three years ago at Donko Academy unofficially entered other schools and destroyed martial arts schools around town. He is known as his sword eater, and Ayas tells Stella and Nikki about that fateful day when Corrado fought her father. He made Kaido fall down, and her father apologized to her that he was not there when Corrado hurt her previously, and attacked him with determination. Ultimately, Corrado defeated her father as she rushed to help him filled with regret. Ayas expresses to Stella and Iki that she blames herself for not standing up against Corrado on that day and reclaiming their place. She regrets that she wasn't able to help her father when he needed her the most and expresses her disappointment that Corrado's sword lacks pride and ability. It's nothing but barbaric violence. Iki then takes them to what used to be her father's house but now belongs to Corrado. Upon entering, they see Corrado's gang members laughing and Iki approaches them and asks if they know about Kaido's whereabouts. After finding his location, they confront Corrado, who just mocks them. Iki steps forward and challenges him to a duel on behalf of Ayas, vowing to win back her family's house and school. Corrado taunts him, mentioning his lack of bravery at the restaurant. However, Iki confidently asserts that this time is different. He reminds Corrado that although they are prohibited from using their devices outside of school without permission, this place once used to be a martial arts school. As a schoolmaster, if Corrado gives permission, they can engage in a duel. Corrado laughs and agrees, stating that Iki needs to meet his qualifications before the duel can begin. Iki faces off against one of Corrado's gang members and asks if this satisfies the qualification. In response, Corrado summons his deadly sword Orochimaru, which can transform into different shapes. The battle begins, and Corrado charges forward but Iki manages to defend himself. Corrado starts attacking him repeatedly, and he dodges them with effort before charging at Corrado, but it has no impact on him. Iki is puzzled by Corrado's abilities and wonders if he realized his intentions. Corrado then transforms his sword into a long, deadly, snake-like bone creature and attacks Iki fiercely while mocking him. Despite his efforts, Corrado's incredible speed and reflexes make him seem unbeatable. Iki barely manages to hold off his attacks, even after using his perfect vision. Iki realizes that Corrado's ability lies in his speed and reflexes, which allowed him to defeat Kaido's father previously. Her auto applauds him for being the first one to discover his ability called the Marginal Counter. After the first battle, they proceed to attack Iki from two directions at the same time but he manages to dodge their attacks by using his irregular guarding move. So Corrado attacks him from all four directions, overwhelming him and causing him to lose balance and avoid the fatal attack. They continue fighting, and Ayas notices that the fight is similar to what happened to her dad. She tries to intervene, but Stella stops her, explaining that if she interrupts, she won't get her family's home or school back. Stella adds that Iki is enjoying the fight and trying to figure out how to defeat Corrado. As the battle rages on, Ayas realizes that her father's defeat wasn't because he was weak, but because Corrado was a formidable opponent. Observing Iki enjoying the battle, she realizes that her father must have felt the same joy in his last fight and remembers him apologizing for being that way even though he truly enjoyed it. Regret floods Ayas as she now understands her father's words and she starts crying, realizing that she is not a true swordswoman as she couldn't fully comprehend the mind and soul of the fighter. Stella discerns Corrado's weakness, constantly attacking due to his marginal counter move, which is causing him to exhaust his stamina. 
Meanwhile, Corrado praises Icky's stubbornness, and Icky responds by saying that he hates losing and is having too much fun to end the battle. Determined, Icky promises Ayaz that he will avenge her father's misfortune and strikes Corrado, surprising him with the essence of Kaido's technique. He successfully employs Kaido's secret technique Tenai Mubo, which Kaido had attempted to use in his last battle but failed. Ayaz is amazed that Icky knows this technique, and Stella reveals that she experienced the same technique from him during her mock battle. Impressed by Icky's performance, Corrado asks for his name and tells him that they will continue their fight at the Seven Star Battle Festival before leaving and tells him to do whatever he wants with this place after the battle. Ayaz apologizes for not understanding the true meaning of swordsmanship but Ikki assures her that it is not her fault. The only reason he won today is that he learned Kaido's secret technique by observing her moves. He believes that she is the true successor to her father's legacy. Ayaz expresses her gratitude for his encouragement and tells him that she needs to become even stronger to be confident enough to carry on her father's legacy. Together, they decide to rebuild the martial arts school that once belonged to her father. Later, Stella informs Iki that Ayaz has apparently confessed to the selection match committee that she committed foul play in her match against him, resulting in her removal from the election matches and a suspension of 10 days. They both appreciate Ayaz for taking responsibility for her actions. Just then, Stella receives a message from Ayaz revealing that her father has regained consciousness. Excited about the news, they celebrate each other's company, but their joyful moment is rudely interrupted by Shizuku and Alice, who are eavesdropping on their conversation from behind a bench. Stella quickly comes up with a cover story, pretending that they were only having a thumb wrestling match, and nothing else was going on. Stella and Shizuku exchange insults as they usually do, leaving Alice and Iki standing awkwardly in the middle of their banter. In the upcoming battles, Iki continues to secure victory, winning the last 12 matches consecutively without a single loss. His incredible performance earns him the admiration of the crowd, and they hail him as a master, referring to him as the Another One. Impressed by Iki's exceptional performance in the selection matches, the director recognizes him and Stella as star students with great potential in their year. As a result, the director assigns them to the school's training camp in a place called Okutama, where they will receive proper training. Excited about the journey, Stella exclaims about the fresh air and appreciates the director for organizing the training camp. Iki agrees that it is nice to get a week off from school. They cross beautiful locations on the way, and Stella gets excited. Meanwhile, Alice and Shizuka are at the metro station. She expresses her unhappiness that she couldn't stop her brother and Stella from going on the trip and asks him to come along with her to cheer her. But he tells her that he unfortunately made other plans for today and sends her off on a train, encouraging her to be strong before he leaves. At the training camp, Stella enjoys spending time with Icky and encourages him to do more lover's stuff and proceeds to kiss him. Instead of returning the affection, he stops her and points to a group of people who happen to be the student council members. After reaching their lodging, Stella and a boy called Renrin have a fierce badminton match using their magical powers. They seem to be evenly matched, and everyone witnessing their match wonders what kind of nonsense the game is, as it is not a typical badminton match. Icky asks the white lady, Canada, why they are here, and she responds that they have to work for the student council and asks if he is here for the same reason. He realizes with shock that she and Stella have been tricked by the director. Later, Stella is made to clean the floor of the training camp, and the umbrella lady informs her that the training camp will take place here only after a month. Until then, they all have to clean the entire camp in preparation. Stella regrets coming and realizes that the student council's job is more boring than she thought. Everyone is cleaning with great enthusiasm except her, and she begins to see the student council members in a new light, realizing the responsibilities they hold. The little boy, Itakata, reveals that they only asked the director for an extra helping hand, and the director sent him to Stella. He tells Iki that their student council president, Tapato, has been dying to meet him at least once. Canada informs him that Toka has been running late doing some errands and that she will soon join them after their boring cleaning work. Stella and Iki decide to explore and visit the waterfalls. They inform the student council members about their plan and Renrin mocks him, suggesting that he wants to have private time with Stella. The student council members wish them luck and encourage them to have some fun. Icky and Stella hike up a mountain that happens to be steeper than they thought, but Stella becomes tired. 
He asks her if she is alright because even earlier that day she only ate two bowls of ramen like a normal girl instead of seven bowls like she usually does. She tells him that she is fine, and they continue climbing the mountain. Meanwhile, Shizuku arrives home and heads to her room where her cat greets her affectionately by rubbing against her leg. She discovers childhood photos of Iki in her room, bringing happiness to her heart as she admires the pictures. She is called to the living room where it becomes apparent that her father wants to talk. However, their conversation becomes tense when Shizuko expresses her discontent with the way he treats Iki. Back at the camp, Stella's condition worsens, and she becomes increasingly tired and unwell. Iki takes care of her and suggests returning to the camp if she isn't improving. She tells him that she is feeling dizzy and nauseous and even questions him in horror if the kiss they shared the other day could have got her pregnant. Iki reassures her that it's not possible and wonders if she is just playing the innocent girl or being foolish. He suggests that she might have caught a cold, but Stella admits that she has never had one before and feels that her body is not cooperating with her. But before he could take her to the camp, the training starts, so he takes her to a mountain lodge instead. Iki continues to care for Stella and checks for a fever. Just as he predicted, she has a high fever. After comforting her, they talk about their relationship, and Iki expresses his desire to proudly talk about their relationship to both of their families. Just then, he's interrupted by a phone call from the student council members who are concerned about their well-being. Iki explains the situation to them, informing them that they are currently inside a mountain lodge waiting for the rain to subside. Unbeknownst to them, a stalker is watching Iki and Stella and is reporting their location to someone on the phone. Meanwhile, at Shizuko's home, she and her father continue their tense conversation, and she eventually decides to leave, stating that she only came home because of her mother's messages. However, her father reveals that he was the one who wrote those messages, pretending to be her mother, as he knew she wouldn't respond to his texts and would respond to her mother's. Shizuko asks him what he wants, and he claims that he is merely concerned about her well-being. He expresses pride in her for winning all 12 selection matches and assures her that he is confident she will become the school representative and participate in the seven-star tournament. However, she scoffs at his words and points out that Iki is also doing well in the selection matches, questioning why he doesn't care about that. She then leaves. Back at the mountain lodge, Iki hears some noise and goes outside to find a giant being made of rocks attacking their lodging. He rushes back in to protect Stella, carrying her to safety under a tree before facing off against the giant rock monster, summoning his sword. Iki attacks the monster, but to his surprise, it splits into smaller rock monsters, making it difficult for him to defeat them. The monsters attack him and head towards Stella next. Just then, Renrin arrives and rescues Stella, passing her to Iki. The rest of the student council arrives and fights the rock monsters. Iki speculates that the monsters must be controlled by a magical knight. Yudakata joins him and explains that this has to be the work of a person using the steel wire ability. He further explains that individuals with a steel wire ability use magical strings to remotely control inorganic substances like these rocks. Suddenly, the president of the council, Toka Todu, arrives and joins the fight. She explains that no matter how far the steel wire is used, they're all connected by the same powers as the monster, making them traceable. Topa uses her thunder slash attack to defeat the rock monsters, and Iki is astonished by her incredible strength and abilities. Her powerful attack travels through the magical string, injuring the steel wire user who is still away from the scene. Iki marvels at her prowess as one of the top four finalists from the previous year's battles and the strongest knight of the academy. Meanwhile, Shizuko receives a message revealing that her next opponent in the seven-star battle will be Toka Todu and finds this news amusing. The next week, Shizuku takes a trip down her memory lane, reminiscing about her childhood. She remembers how adults forgive mistakes in front of power, but her brother Iki never bowed down to power. It inspired her to be strong. At that time, she didn't know anything about the harshness or coldness of the solitude he was bearing, as everyone in her family treated him like he never existed. So no matter what happens, she will follow in his footsteps and prove her strength by winning a match against Toka in the Seven Star Battle Festival. Later that day, during lunch, Iki, Stella, and Alice discuss Toka to do's powers after reading an article about her. Alice questions Iki about Toka, but he replies that he didn't get to talk to her much and only witnessed a fraction of her power during her battle with the rock monster. But even that was enough to confirm the rumors that she was very powerful. Stella worries that Shizuko might lose, and Alice tells her that she's having mock battles with upperclassmen who are lightning users to prepare for her battle with Toka. He further explains that Shizuko's ability to control magical power at a very high level allows her to create ultra-pure water that doesn't conduct lightning 
countering the natural disadvantage water has against lightning. Despite this, Iki is still worried about Shizuko, and although he wants her to win, he doesn't want her to be hard on herself. Later, Shizuku shares her feelings with Alice, expressing her love for Iki and her desire to be strong to help him. She vows to show her strength in the upcoming match and prove herself. Afterwards, the battle between Shizuku and Toka begins. They face each other in the arena, and the commentator announces that Toka is the number one on the ranking list. She tells the audience that she is so fast that one can't avoid her, and her golden lightning flash attack will strike her opponent in the blink of an eye. Shizuku summons her sword first, and Toka follows suit by summoning her thunder sword. She is recounting back to her childhood how she loves her brother and is determined to win. For a while, neither of them moves and simply stares at each other, confusing the audience and the commentators. Instructor Sekayo, who is the supervisor of this match, explains to the commentator that the candidates are waiting to see how their opponent will move, as they are both strong enough to be a 7-star champion. But the one who moves carelessly will lose. Iki knows that Shizuku doesn't want to make the first move in this match because Toka has the strongest weapon she can use in close range. He reveals to Stella that her noble art was so strong and intense that Toka was nicknamed after it as the Ray Curie, a super electromagnetic sword drawing technique. He explains that in the past, Toka used this technique to defeat many of her opponents. Once she draws the sword and uses the technique, one can be sure that she will slash her opponent down, and no one has been able to survive her close-range attacks before. Shizuku creates a protective barrier by creating an ice field. Toka instantly avoids this and makes a counter-attack from long distance, as predicted by Shizuku. She summons a giant wave and sends water bullets across to Toka, who deflects all the water bullets with her thunder sword and hits back at the wave. She continues attacking, and her lightning speed becomes apparent. Iki explains to Stella that to keep Shizuku's wave technique going, she has to generate ultra-pure water. On the other hand, Toka only has to keep on attacking with her lightning. Suddenly, Shizuku uses her ice to hold Toka in one place and launches a huge ice attack at her. But Toka breaks free from the ice, and everyone cheers for them for giving such an extraordinary battle. Toka wonders how Shizuku was able to counter-attack and trap her in the ice, as it is impossible for Shizuku to see through her magical power control. Suddenly, with a blink of an eye, Toka moves close to Shizuku and launches into a series of attacks against her. Barely dodging them, Toka does it again and this time it lands on Shizuku, injuring her pretty badly. But it turns out Toka had actually attacked Shizuku's water shadow, and not her. But even still, she got a cut because of the impact. As the battle progresses, Shizuko can't see through Toka's moves and finds herself at a disadvantage. Everyone is confused why the battle is not even like before, as Shizuku is now only managing to barely defend against Toka's attacks. Iki reveals to Stella that Toka's technique is known as Nukiyushi, which hides the opponent's existence from their unconscious mind. He recalls that instructor Sekayo had done this to him once. He explains that although Shizuku's eyes are following Toka's moves, her conscious mind categorizes them as unnecessary information, making them unrecognizable. Suddenly, Sekayo emerges in front of him, proving that he was right. She tells him that the technique is a combination of stealthy steps and breathing techniques from ancient martial arts. Just then, the director appears out of nowhere and asks how he recognized Hokus's technique. He tells her that he was actually surprised that a student could do the same thing as Sekayo. The director tells him that it is obvious because they both learned from the same knight, who is the god of battle called Nango. Sekayo becomes embarrassed that the director revealed her secret and curses her master. She makes a random excuse and is sent away by the director, who tells Iki that by now, he should know that his sister won't be able to break free from Toka's special Nukiyushi technique. He agrees and speculates that Shizuku needs something to counter Toka's close-range advantage, and he suspects she might have a chance if she finds such a strategy. If not, she will lose for sure. Determined to show Iki how much she loves him, she decides to go beyond her limits and goes on the offensive, proceeding to attack fiercely with her water blades. Toka counters the attack and attacks in return. They go back and forth for a while, trying to attack each other. As the battle intensifies, Shizuko creates a magical ice field to move freely and attacks Toka. She creates more water shadows to attack her inside the fog, and Toka is struggling to move as freely as her. Shizuku then uses her special water blade technique on her. However, Topa counters just in time with her ultimate lightning attack and strikes her down. Despite her tremendous efforts, Shizuku loses the match and is admitted to the hospital. When she wakes up in the hospital, she sees Stella, Alice, and Iki waiting for her, concerned. 
Upon realizing that she lost, she asks everyone to leave, saying that she is tired. They leave the room as per her request, but Iki and Stella watch her from outside. Alice tells Stella that Shizuko has become really strong. He comforts her by hugging her and praises her for performing very well. He tells her that Iki watched her until the end, and she doesn't need to be too hard on herself. Shizuko hugs him back and cries, letting out her emotions. In the days to come, Stella emerges victorious in a total of 14 matches. Following each battle, she and Iki take leisurely strolls in the woods, engaging in discussions about their progress in the ongoing matches. With a playful tone, Stella credits her newfound strength and increased stamina to Iki's training sessions humorously labeling them as torture. During their conversations, they reminisce about the promise they made to participate in the Seven Star Festival Finals and mutually agree that winning all the remaining matches is the key to achieving this goal. Meanwhile, at school, notices begin to circulate, indicating that only four matches remain for the selection of the school representative. The director at the school takes an interest in Akaza, a shady old man associated with the International Federation Magical Knights. In a meeting with Iki, she probes into Iki's knowledge of Akaza and expresses concerns about his potential secretive activities around the school. Iki confirms his familiarity with the man, recounting a few encounters during his time living in his parents' house. The revelation that Akaza is now working under Iki's father prompts the director to share her suspicion that he might be covertly investigating the school. While expressing surprise at Akaza's alleged actions, Iki attributes them to the man's personal animosity towards him. Later, Stella and Iki receive a request to visit the student council. Upon arrival, they are warmly greeted by Toka Tadu, the president of the student council. However, the reason for their visit remains unclear as Toka instructs Yudakata to return comics to the shelf and scolds other members for misplacing their belongings. Perplexed by the trivial nature of the request, Stella and Iki observe the scene, wondering about the purpose of their visit. The subsequent scene reveals a different side of Toka as they all visit a place where the president is actively involved in social welfare activities. Toka extends help to children in need, and Yudakata shares his past experience of being in a similar situation a few years earlier. The children, recognizing Stella from TV, approach her and she willingly joins them in play. In a heartwarming turn of events, Iki, Toka, and Yudakata engage in preparing food for the underprivileged children. Grateful for Toka's assistance at the camp, Iki expresses his thanks and acknowledges the strength displayed by Toka's sister, Shizuku. Toka enlightens them about her unique ability as a lightning user, explaining that she can sense human actions through the weak electric currents transmitted by the brain. This ability, known as reverse sight, allows her to detect traps and sudden attacks. Toga takes charge of the cooking, urging Iki and Yudakata to take a break while the student council members enjoy time with the children. During their break, Iki shares his fascination with Toka with Yudakata, unable to take his eyes off her. Yudakata attributes it to Iki seeing the core of Toka's strength, which emanates from her commitment to helping children facing complex situations and backgrounds of poverty. Yudakata narrates the children's difficult pasts, highlighting Toka's unwavering support that brought positive change to their lives. He emphasizes Toka's mission to provide hope, courage, and support to those in need. As the day progresses, Iki and Stella return to school on a bus. Upon arrival, they encounter Alice, Shizuku, and Kagami, a reporter, who presents them with a newspaper featuring a photo of their kiss. The news has gained attention due to Stella's popularity, and the article paints Iki negatively, suggesting his misconduct has been a recurring issue for the Knight Federation. Enraged by the false portrayal, Stella burns the paper. Suddenly, Akaza arrives in a luxurious car, revealing that the incident has led to a hearing by the Ethics Committee of the International Federation. He requests Iki's presence at the hearing, and despite Stella's attempts to defend him, Iki reluctantly agrees. The hearing becomes a platform where Akaza questions Iki about his relationship with Stella, accusing him of inappropriate conduct. Iki, steadfast in defending their love, refuses to accept any wrongdoing. Akaza imposes restrictions, ordering Iki to speak only when asked to avoid creating a negative impression. In the midst of this, the director confides in Sakayo, expressing her awareness that Akaza is using underhanded tactics to discredit Iki. At the hearing, Iki is confined to a cell for the night and informed that he must appear at 6 a.m. the following day. Meanwhile, Stella continues to win battles, but the press is abuzz with rumors about her and Iki. Troubled by the negative impact their relationship is having on Iki, she contemplates breaking up to spare him from further scrutiny. The subsequent day forces Iki to have his selection match at the committee headquarters instead of the school, facing an opponent named Oriki. 
personal conversations are prohibited during the match, adding a layer of complexity to the already challenging situation. Back at the school, Shizuku, Alice, Stella, and Kagami engage in a conversation about Iki in the school cafeteria. Kagami shares a new article reporting Iki's narrow victory, and Alice reveals that the news is under the influence of the Ethics Committee, leading to a biased narrative against Iki. Overwhelmed by guilt and remorse, Stella seeks advice from her friends, considering whether breaking up with Iki is the right course of action. In a surprising turn, Shizuku intervenes, hitting Stella with a water attack and conveying the importance of understanding Iki's sacrifices. She warns Stella against betraying him, emphasizing the depth of Iki's commitment to their relationship. In the following days, Iki continued his winning streak, achieving victories in a total of 16 battles. Instructor Yuri-chan offers support during moments of exhaustion, secretly providing Iki with a token of encouragement from Stella. The gesture involves a piece of Stella's hair, offering Iki renewed determination for his upcoming battles. Meanwhile, Stellar remains dedicated to winning her matches to fulfill the promise of facing Iki in the finals. Iki takes a bold step by requesting Akaza to arrange a meeting with his father, Itsuki Kuragan. During the meeting, Itsuki acknowledges Iki's victories in the selection matches but bluntly expresses reservations about his perceived lack of talent. These words deeply affect Iki prompting him to realize that he has been seeking validation in the wrong place. As the time for Iki's final battle against Toka to do approaches, the ethics committee issues a threat to strip Iki of his maid status if he loses. However, they offer a compromise. If Iki wins against Toka, they will drop the hearing. Iki reluctantly agrees to these terms, setting the stage for a crucial and challenging confrontation. In this intricate web of battles, personal struggles, and external pressures, Iki and Stella find themselves navigating a complex path. As they confront the hurdles in their relationship, the strength of their bond becomes increasingly evident, propelling them forward despite the adversities. The battles, both within the arena and beyond, shape their characters and illuminate the resilience required to pursue their dreams in the face of relentless challenges. The next day, Iki ponders upon his father's words and Toka's selfless actions of taking care of poor kids and giving them courage. He looks down at his empty, worthless sword, wondering what he should do now. Meanwhile, Toka speaks with her mom on the phone, and Shizuko arrives. Yudakata welcomes her, and Toka apologizes for asking her to come. She asks if Shizuko knew that Iki's next opponent was her. Shizuko confirms that she indeed knew about this and expresses her concern about the Federation's questionable methods. Chopper tells her that she had no choice but to accept their decision. Even though she heard that Iki's condition was bad, she believes he would be on the battlefield giving everything to beat her. Toka adds that she can't cut corners when facing him, she has to fight him with her heart and soul. She asks Shizuko if she will request Iki to withdraw from the battle. Shizuko tells her that she needs time to think about it and later asks Alice if she should stop Iki from participating in the battle. Alice tells Shizuko that only she can find the answer to this since she is the only person in the family Iki opened up to. And she understands how strong Tono's resolve is from her experience in her past battle with her. Shizuko questions herself, wondering if she will be proud of going to the national competition after such a battle, regardless of whether she wins the battle by default if Iki withdraws or wins against him if he appears. Yudakata reminds her that the match might be fixed by some of the ethics committee adults to fulfill their selfish desires, and tells her that she needs to fight in a way she could be proud of herself. Meanwhile, Stella is practicing for her own battle. Later, the final school selection match is announced with six matches in six different locations, and the winners will receive tickets to the Seven Star Battle Festival. Iki faces Mizuki Ohanada, one of the school representatives, and the audience eagerly await the battle between Iki and Toka, which is being telecast on TV. The director and Sakayo discuss Iki's upcoming match and how Akaza could have manipulated this situation to fix Toka as Iki's opponent, and that he has no other choice but to win against her. Just then, the legendary battle god Nango arrives, much to Sakayo's annoyance and surprise. They bicker for a while, and the director welcomes him, asking if he came to see Toka. Nango informs that although Toka is her favorite pupil, he actually came to see Iki's performance because he is from a Korean family. Suddenly, Akaza joins the conversation and suggests that the match might be cancelled. The announcement states that Iki has not arrived yet, and if he doesn't show up within 15 minutes, Toka will be declared the winner. The director questions Akaza of why Iki hasn't come yet, as he promised that the Federation would bring Iki in their car. He simply shrugs and tells her there might have been a miscommunication. And when he went to pick him up in the car, 
Icky had already left by himself. He coldly tells her that Icky is not a child, so he should be fine unless he collapses on the way. Then Akaza laughs evilly. Meanwhile, exhausted and tired, Icky thinks of his grandfather's words and struggles to reach the campus. Doubt rises in him if he had irresponsibly chosen to live by his grandfather's motto of not giving up and hence having to constantly live beyond his abilities. His doubt asks him how he can defeat Toka when nobody wanted him, and tells him that's why he ended up with a weak sword. Just then, Shizuku finds him and holds him against her, telling him that she doesn't want him to fight Toka, but she wouldn't stop him either. She expresses that she just wishes to see him happy and wants him to keep smiling. Everyone, including the students he trained, the members of the student council, Yuri-chan, the reporter girl, and Iki, encourage and cheer him on. Shizuku reminds him that he had encouraged everyone and that they all dream through him, and Iki is not alone. He finally sees Stella, who excitedly waves at him and shows him the medal she got from winning the battles, and finally getting a chance to participate in the Seven Star Festival like they promised earlier. With her new determination and purpose, Iki decides to take part in the battle and arrives at the arena. Toka and Iki enter the battlefield, and the crowd eagerly waits for the battle to begin. Toka apologizes to Iki, confessing that she couldn't help but get excited about their battle ever since she first saw him. Iki shares the same feeling, promising not to show a shameful fight to her or anyone who supported him. He swears to give his strongest effort to beat her. They summon their swords, and the final battle begins. Iki initiates his opening attack and calls his ultimate technique, Ido Shura, at the start itself, shocking everyone. Stella, however, remains calm, believing he decided to fight straightforwardly without using any tricks to win. Toka realizes if she manages to avoid his attacks now, she will surely win the battle. Iki is inferior in strength compared to Toka, but he puts his all into the extreme moment to land one perfect swing. Toka prepares to counter with her ultimate lightning slash attack, but Iki summons his seventh sword and strikes her before she can counter. She collapses on the ground, and thus, Iki emerges as the winner, shocking everyone. Nango questions if Toka lost on purpose, but Nango explains that Toka used all her power to counter Iki, who expanded his limit at the last moment to strike her down with something beyond. In her shura, Sekio suggests naming this new technique in Toretsu, something more extreme than extreme, overwhelming like a demon or monster. Akaza couldn't believe it and screams that it is impossible and goes to do something to discredit Iki's success. But the director tells Sekio that it is too late, as Iki had proven himself, and no one could deny him his victory anymore. As Iki struggles not to collapse, Akaza tries to attack him, but Stella defends him and confronts Akaza for challenging Iki in such a condition with her sword and rushes to Iki, expressing her love for him just the way he is. Iki realizes that Stella's warmth is what saved him and asks her if she would be his family. She accepts the proposal and agrees to be his bride. Everyone cheers for Iki and Stella, and Shizuku accepts the reality of their relationship. Meanwhile, Itsuki receives a call from the Emperor of Vermilion, Stella's father, who informs him that he found out about Iki's proposal to Stella. Itsuki quickly apologizes, but the Emperor dismisses it, suggesting that their kids should be kept out of the adult schemes and wishes for their happiness. Later, the winners of the selection match for the Seven Star Festival are announced, Iki, Canada, Alice, Stella, and two other girls. They will be participating in the Seven Star Festival and tournament as the school representatives. The director then calls Tapa to the stage where she announces Iki as their new president, and the audience cheers for him as their leader. She expresses her pride in him. Iki credits her for his growth. Toka encourages him to carry the hopes of those who lost and to reach the top of the Seven Stars tournament with the school's flag, and he promises to do so. Later, Iki confides in Stella. They used to think he didn't care about others' opinions as long as he knew his worth, but being acknowledged by others actually feels good, especially by someone he likes. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more please make sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel with notifications turned on so you never miss a future video. And until next time guys, take care.